Hi, this is Pastor Josh, and I just want to thank you for watching or listening to these teachings. Our hope is that through these teachings that you would learn more about God and grow closer to Him in relationship. But we also hope that these would be an additional teaching to what you already receive in your church home. If you don't have a church home, we would love to have you here at Cornerstone. So we do pray that through these teachings that you would hear God through the proclamation of His Word. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God says that each and every one of us are either in the darkness or we're in the light. That's it. We got a choice. In the darkness or in the light. That's it. He doesn't say that we can switch back and forth from darkness to light, darkness to light. He says we're either in the darkness or we're in the light. And so the question we have to ask ourselves this morning is, what are we in? Are we in darkness or are we in light? It's more important, that question is more important about whether you're going to get to retire or not. It's, it's more important than what college you go to, you young teenagers. It's more important than who you're going to get to hang out with this week, young children. It's more important than any of those questions. Are you in the light or are you in the darkness? That's the question that we have before us because of this text. John previously in verses 1 through 3, he's talking about the word. We looked at that last week. That Jesus is the Word. He is the Creator. He is the one who's come into flesh. He existed before creation. And he says He was the Word. But now He goes forward and He says this, that He is also the light. And I'm not making these things up. You can look. Go to verse 4. In Him, who's Him? He's referring to the Word. Who is the Word referring to? Jesus and so he kind of has this link here. In him was life. Well, why does he say that? Because previously he just said all things were made through him. There was no thing, not one thing that wasn't made through him. Jesus, the son. He was the word. And so, you know, think of a chain and, and a, a link in a chain. It connects to another link and another link. Right here, John presents us with Jesus. He says, Jesus is the word. And he chains him to life, physical life. He says, the only reason we all exist is because Jesus has, in fact, created us physically. But then he goes forward here in verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. So not only is he chained with physical life, but he's also chained now with light. That is spiritual life. That is how we live, holy living, correct living, living as children of God. And when we say uh, that he was the light, he's not talking about like these guru kind of things. These things where you sit down, cross-legged, put your fingers up, hum and chant, and then wait till the energy, you feel you're filled with energy. And you say, oh, I got the light now. That's not at all what he's saying. He's saying... Jesus, the Word, is the one who has created all things. There's not one thing He hasn't created. And in fact, He is the light. He is the one who reveals to us how we are to live. What is the appropriate way to respond to the God who has, in fact, created us? So, He says, Jesus is the Word, but He's also the light. He's the life. What is the purpose of of a light to shine, all right? And it shines, why does it shine? So that you can see. So that's what he says here. 
You know, and if we turned out all the lights, or, or it probably wouldn't work in this room because there's a mirror or window behind us. But have you ever been in a room that's extremely dark? I mean, there's no windows, no cracks, nothing. And you go in there and the lights are off and it's so dark you can't see and you can't really tell whether your eyes are closed or open. You ever been in that place? I, told, I probably told you the story of when we, my friend and I were in Colorado and we were out in the middle of the forest and it was cloudy day, uh, cloudy night. So there was no moon, there was no stars. We were out where the, I can't remember what river starts up there, but we were way up there. And it was so dark, and we had to walk to a cabin, and we didn't have any lights. So we had to hold each other, lovingly as friends. (laughs) Because, literally, I couldn't see him right here. And so if we began to walk, and then we would lose each other. So we, we held on to each other. That's the excuse why we held on to each other. We weren't scared, but we couldn't see anything. Okay, in that, if we had the tiniest little light, you know, what do they call those bugs? What do you call them? Lightning bugs, right? Fireflies, lightning bugs, or just a little bitty match, or just a little bitty candle in a dark room where you can't see anything, what does it do? It lights up the room, right? Now you can see. It is shining and you can see. Why? So it says Jesus is what? The light. It says he is the light. He doesn't say what. He is a light. The source of light in our lives comes from one person, one God, that is Jesus, but I would be foolish to tell you that there's not false lights in our world. There's a great false light out there called Satan, called the devil. I was reminded this week, you know, as Christians and even as people, we often live like the devil doesn't exist. Think about it. We live kind of like the devil doesn't exist, but he does And all of his followers, they are interacting in our world today. Ephesians says we don't struggle with like powers, like people and and presidents and governments, those sorts of things. He says we actually struggle against the spiritual world behind all that, the things that influence those things. Those are the fruits, but the root is behind it all. That's why we pray against those things, the schemes of the devil, and we pray to a God who's greater than the devil. But let me remind you of who Satan is. 2 Corinthians 11.14 says this, And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. As an angel of light. An angel of light? That's an angel of God. But he's not an angel of God. He was created as an angel. But he turned. He's wicked. He's an angel of darkness. But he puts on these clothes. He tries to say, I'm an angel of light. I'm here for your good. 2 Corinthians 4 4 says this In their case, the God of this world, the God of this world, the little g God, Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from what? Seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Last week we find out Jesus was the word. He is the creator. Today, with this verse in mind, it says that the devil, the enemy, who disguises himself as an angel of light, what he actually does is blind people so that they can't see Jesus for who he really is. The Savior, your Savior. The King, your King. The Lord, your Lord. That's what the enemy does. And so he's disguising himself. Think about this. The devil won't walk up to you and say, hey, everybody, I'm the devil. I'm here to hurt you. He comes up to you and says, hey, how's your day? How can I help you? What do you need? So what do you think? He's disguising himself as the angel of light. You and I need to understand. We need to be able to discern. Okay, Who is the light and who is the one that pretends to be light? 
There's many societies out there. Maybe you've heard of them. Maybe you haven't. And, and you, people have certain thoughts about them. People don't. But one of them, I'll call it, one of them, one of these secret societies is called the Illuminati. Now, I'm not going to go down the trail of what the Illuminati and all these sorts of things that they talk about. But the Illuminati, they claim, this is their claim, this secret group, this secret society, claim to have a knowledge, and they claim it this way, that they are enlightened to something that you and I are not know about. And so if you can get into this group, this secret group, by doing secret things, then you also can be enlightened. You can have the secret knowledge that nobody knows about, but it's the answer to all the problems in the world. It's an answer to power in the world. Doesn't that sound like an angel of the light who's put on deceptive clothes to blind you to say, yeah, I have all the answers. I'm here to help you. But at the end of the day, they won't. Why? Because they're not the light. They're deceivers. They're the enemy who pretends to be the light. You say, well, okay, the Illuminati, whatever. That's, I'll just tell you this. It's not anything new. John, the book we're reading, at this time, 2,000 years ago, there was a thing called Gnosticism. It actually still exists today, partly. What was Gnosticism? It comes from the word gnosko, Gnostic, G. It starts with a G, by the way. Gnosko. What does that mean? To know. What were they saying back here in John's time? When Jesus had just died, we have, this is what they were saying, we have a secret knowledge. We really know what's going on. We've been enlightened, something that y'all don't know about. But if you come on over into our group, we will tell you and you'll have this secret Gnosticism. See any difference between there and today? No, it will always exist. Because there is an enemy out there who tries to deceive us into thinking he is the light, but he's not the light. It says that Christ is the light. So I'll just say this, if you're in one of these groups, or if you've you know, placed just like a little hand or a little foot or a little toe into these groups, get out. I talked to a man when I first got saved at the age of 18. Young man, I didn't know anything about anything that was going on. I didn't grow up in church. But he was telling me about one of these groups he was in. And he thought he was saved. But then he heard the real gospel that Jesus saves us. And he responded and God changed his life. And he all of a sudden saw the group that he was in was not light. It was darkness. It was evil. And he talks about how difficult it was, almost to the point of getting killed, to get out of this group because of how dark it was, even though they didn't know it at the time. So what I tell you, get out of these groups. Anything secret, anything pointing to a, a light that's not of Christ isn't the light. It's very simple. The devil disguises himself. And there's so many fake and false lights out there today more than, than in the past. Do you know why? Because today we have technology that makes it available to us anywhere. We can look at someone from Africa, from China, from South America, or they can look at someone from here on TV, on the radio, on the Internet. So now we have access to so, much, so many things. There's a lot of preachers on TV. Not all of them, but many of them. Guess what? False lights. Hey, you put in $5 over here and you'll get 500 back. That's false. It's false. Or, or how about in just the office? You put me in office and I'll have the, I have the answer to solve the problem. Why? Because I have the light. Are you seeing the foolishness of our world? The schemes behind the world? There are false lights out there. Now let me show you how you can tell some of these false lights. But before I do, I want to remind you of Genesis 2. Because this is what a false light does. This, okay, we know the light is Christ, but there's some that proclaim to have this knowledge, to have great things, to have the answers to all your problems. 
But I want to show you the father of all lies, the devil, what he does and how he does it, how he pretends to be the light, but he twists it just a little bit. You don't have to turn to Genesis 2, but some of you did. But Genesis 2, the serpent comes along, the evil one comes along to Adam and Eve, and he says to them these words, did God really say this? That's what he says. How did he start out? He started out by talking about what? God's word. Did God say this? That you can't eat from this tree? Well, he, well yeah, he did. He said we die. I Watch this. You don't see it in there, but this is what's happening. I have the true light. I have this secret knowledge that if you eat from that tree, you'll be like God. Why don't you eat from the tree? He's hiding things from you. You see how the enemy attacks? He attacks through God's word, but he twists it just a little bit to make it wrong, and then it has great chaos as a result. Did God really say this? Is that what his word really says? Yeah, it does. You're not going to die. He's just doing that because he knows you'll be like him if you eat from it. Well, now the tree looks good. Yeah, maybe God is wrong. Maybe he's right. Let me eat from it. Let me get the true knowledge. Let me get the true light. And they eat from it. And what happened? Chaos. Sin. Do y'all know an Adam and Eve? Did anybody know them? Have y'all met them? Did y'all eat lunch with them? Why not? They're dead. God said, you eat from this tree, you will die. He wasn't being cruel. He was being a father, a protective, loving father. Don't eat from this or you will die. Here comes Satan using God's word. You're not going to die. Did he say eat from the tree? No, this is really what's going to happen. I have the true light. I have the true knowledge. Listen to me. Okay, dead. Satan's plan is for you to look inwardly at yourself, to puff yourself up, but ultimately he knows that's just going to kill you anyways. But he's trying to get you to look on yourself rather than who God is. He did it with Adam and Eve. He said, you will be like God. But if you looked at Genesis 1.26, God said this, let us make man in our image. And God did what? So God created them, male and female, in his image. Guess what? We were already like God. Now here comes the tempter. You're not like God. That tree won't kill you. You need this true knowledge. Look at yourself. You can get there. Yes, I can. And you do it. And guess what happens? You no longer are like God. You're like darkness because you're in sin. And we die. As a result, God's word is true. He has the true light. And there are false lights out there. Don't listen to them. He pointed to them and he twisted the scripture. When someone is pointing to you and saying, yeah, you can do this. You're great. You're awesome. But they never point to God or they say, yeah, but you can be like him. These are sorts of ways. They're probably being a false light. Because a true light points to God's word and says, now, God, this is what should happen. God said we will die. I'm not doing it. God probably would have came along and said, and they had that conversation with Adam. God, that serpent, he came up to me. He said I needed to eat from the tree. He said I'd be like you. I told him no. Good job. Let me go destroy him. Maybe that would have been our future. No pain in pregnancy. No work with thorns in our hands. No death. We lost a sister in our church. We had her funeral yesterday, or her graveside, Miss Latrice Swinson. Her husband passed just a few months ago. That would have never existed if they wouldn't have listened to the serpent, to this false light. Luke 4, don't turn there, but Luke 4, Jesus is out in the wilderness and he's getting tempted by who? The devil. The devil comes up to Jesus. What do you think he says? Hey, Jesus, I'm the devil. I'm here to hurt you. What does he do? Jesus, you're hungry. Man, you haven't eaten in 10 days. I know 
I know that you're powerful because you came from, from heaven. Now these stones right here, they're, they're, they're just round. They look, don't they look just like a round piece of bread, a round loaf of bread? You're so powerful, Jesus. Just turn these stones into bread. And he did. See what he did? He attacked Satan or Jesus himself, his, his selfishness, and said, Don't listen to God. Do what you need to do. And when you look at Luke 4, Satan's always claiming scripture. He goes, Hey, he takes him to a high mountain. It's high place, and he shows. He goes, look at all these kingdoms of the world, Jesus. I am the God of this world right now. The devil was. I'm the God of all this. I can give you these things. Jump off this building. God will save you. He says he protects those who are his. You are his, so jump off the building. He'll protect you before you hit the ground. Every time he attacks with the word, twists the word and points it back to yourself, trying to say, this is for you. And he's wrong. Oh man, Jesus, what did he do? What did Jesus say? Jesus said basically this. Are you an idiot? He did. We know that he's the word, right? We know that the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, is inspired by God. He's the reason we have it. And he's saying, Satan, you're trying to use my own words against me. Are you an idiot? I wrote the book. And you're trying to twist scripture on myself? I don't care how hungry I am. God doesn't let me do that. My father doesn't let me do that. And I'm not going to do it because I know you're just trying to make me sin. Because when I sin, if I fail, then there is no way in all of eternity, that people can be forgiven for their sin and come to know my Father again. I'm not going to do that. See, you did that a long time ago with a man named Adam, and he failed, and it brought chaos into this world. It brought sin into this world. Now, everybody, all they want to do is sin. No one is righteous. No, not one. Nobody. But I, you can go ahead and call me the second Adam. Because I am here to reverse all of that. And you can go and talk all you want. You can even kill me if you desire. But you ain't getting me to sin. I'm going to be righteous. And when I'm righteous, I will turn things around. That chaos will be restored. That sin can be forgiven. That lostness where people think they were like God, they can now be like God as children of God. That's why we call Jesus the second Adam is because he never messed up. He lived life perfectly. And guess what? If your life is in this second Adam, then you have eternal life because that's how it's supposed to be in the first place. So who is the light? Jesus. Jesus is the light. And the light shines in the darkness so that we can see what are we to see? The light shines. We've seen that. Jesus is the one who shines. There's a false light, the Satan, the enemy. But why does he shine? What are we to see? Two things. We're to see the light and we're to see the darkness. That's it. Verse four, once again, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. It shines so you can see the light and it shines so that you can see the darkness. Who is the light? Jesus. What is darkness? Anything that is not of God. Anything not of Jesus. When Jesus came into the world, when he was living amongst us, what did he do? He healed those that were sick. He, he stopped the storms. He provided a way for sin to be forgiven, for our failures to be forgiven. He is the light. He came into the dark world where people are broken and fragile, both physically and spiritually. And he says, look, I can heal that. He says to, that, to the lame man, is it easier for me to forgive his sins in his heart or to heal him physically? They're both easy for me. I'm God. And so he heals him physically. He says, get up and walk. The man who could never walk. The man gets up and walks. God has the power to do that. 
what he was showing that he is the light. And then he goes further and he says, not only that, but your sins are forgiven. Your inward life, that I know you're evil. The evilness in your life, the darkness in your life, that you want to do the things you want to do, you want whatever. And he says, I can forgive you for those things. So here comes Jesus, the light, to show us that he is the light and he did it very good. But he also, in showing us who he is, he showed us what darkness is. Things that are not of God. Jesus was a patient man. He got angry in a good way over good things. But he never mistreated anybody. He never, did you ever see him say, I am the king, you bow down to me right now. Did you ever see that? No, instead he did what? He got down on his knees and washed people's feet and said, I'll, I'll bow down and humble myself to you. Why? Because I'm the light. And that's who I am. That's what light is. Humility. Those who would humble themselves. Those who are meek. You know, Jesus could have come in like a chiseled body, you know, like a six foot four kind of guy, chiseled body, whatever kind of hair, just the best clothes. But what does he come like? It says that if you were to look at him, according to the Old Testament, if you were to look at him, you wouldn't think that he was anything special. Just an ordinary man. Not really good looking, maybe not really bad looking, not really extremely strong, but maybe not extremely weak. He's just a man. That's how God chose to come into our world. That right there is the light. That's an example of who God is. That's an example of who you and I are to be. So when people are out there preaching and people are out there telling you messages, you can do this and you can do this and you can do this and you can do this, we can say, no, that doesn't sound like the light to me. Because when I look at Jesus, he didn't come here with chiseled body. He didn't come here riding a high horse or a Lamborghini or anything like that. He came in here ordinary, just like the rest of us. Very humble, very kind, very gracious. So why? I'll be like that. Jesus is the light. There is no other light. Look at verse 6. Look at the witness to the light. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Hmm. Three times has the word witness. Verse 7, he came as a witness to bear witness. Verse 8, he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. We call this man John the Baptist. Okay, this is the one that went before Jesus, who baptized Jesus. That's why we call him John the Baptist. This is not the same John who wrote the book. That John was one of uh, Jesus' followers. This is the one that went before Jesus. And John the Apostle says that this John, the one we call the baptizer, was the one who was the witness. Three times, right? So maybe we should stop calling him John the Baptist, and maybe we should call him what? John the Testifier. That's what he was here for, John the Witness. That's what he did. That was his purpose. To come and be a witness to who? Himself? No. To the light. He was here to get on the stand, and they asked him questions. Okay, who was the, the, the good in the world? Who was the God man in the world? That man right there, Jesus. That's what John's job was. That was the reason he existed. God created him so that he would do everything to point to Jesus because Jesus was the light. He is the only light. He was everything to everyone. And so if John would have said, well, you know, I got some light too. Listen to me. Like, I, I know how to do finances, but then everything else is Jesus. Does John do that? Or, or did he say this? Hey, I know how to baptize y'all. Let me teach y'all on baptism. And let me teach y'all how to witness. That's really looking to yourself rather than looking to who? Christ. See the theme here? It's always pointed to Jesus. So he was sent, it says there in verse 6, he was a man sent from God. He wasn't there on accident. Do you all know a John today, just like Adam and Eve? Does, John, does this John exist in 2019? Is he your friend? Does he work with you? No. He existed here in the 30s, 30 A.D., 2080. Why? 
Because God sent him there at that moment, in that place, in Jerusalem, to testify about Jesus Christ. He's not there by accident. He was there on purpose, sent from God. His name was John. Why was he sent? To be a witness. That's what it says. To be a witness. To point to Jesus. Why did he want to point to Jesus? So that people would believe in Jesus. That he was life. That he was light. Jesus is why we physically exist. And he's the way that we can spiritually exist. That's what John's saying. And what else does it say? Verse 8. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So in John, John the witness, he points to Jesus and says, Jesus is the light. Jesus is the life. He is everything you need. In doing that, when you point there, everybody's attention goes there and everybody forgets about who? John. You'll see that in John chapter 3 when we come to John the Baptist. That he points to them. He says, he must increase and I must decrease because I am here to testify to him, not to myself. I am not the light. If you're a Christian in here, not everyone, but maybe many of you, you say, okay, what does that matter? What, what does that mean to us today? You were born in this moment. You live today in this moment for a reason. God didn't make you exist in the 1700s or the 1500s or 300s. God made you exist today. And he's made you exist in the Haskell area, in your work or wherever it is that you have influence in, in your family. Why? If you are a Christian, it is because you are sent by God into that area, just like John. You are all witnesses, just like me. We are all witnesses to who Jesus is. That's our purpose. We've been sent here by God. Why? To point to the light. That we would tell everybody in Haskell, hey, look, we're just a church. We know we're broken people. We don't have it all together. But we know the one who does. Jesus, that they would believe in him. And when we do that, when we, just like John, point to Jesus, we fade into the background. I always say this. At the end of, at the end of the sermon, I hope that you would go home and not say, man, Josh is a great preacher. You know why? Because all the attention was on me. My whole role here is to testify and to point to Jesus. I hope that when you leave, that you would say, man, we have a great Savior, Jesus Christ. And I hope that you would forget about me. Because that's all I am. I'm replaceable. The mailman. Our church. Cornerstone. Our name is not important to this community. It doesn't matter what Cornerstone, the people say, man, Cornerstone's a great church. They have great things going on there. We want them to say, man, I don't remember the church, I don't remember the people, but I remember the God, Jesus. He is great. He changed my life, both physically and spiritually. That's who we are. We are witnesses, just as John were witnesses. We don't claim to be the light because we are not. I'll tell you that right now. I am not Jesus. Most of y'all know that. I do not have the light, I don't have all the answers. Jesus does. So if you want to know the answers, I'm here to help you with that. But the best thing you can do is to get in God's word. That's what this is about. The best thing you can do for other people is to get that word out. That's what this is about. And it comes from the scripture. So we have the light, Jesus Christ. We have the witness to the light, John the Baptist and you and I. Now we have the response to the light. Verse 9, the true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. We have Jesus here coming into our world. You and I, Philippians 2. He humbled himself, leaving heaven, coming to earth in human flesh. Verse 14, the word became flesh, dwelt among us. That's where we're headed next week. But we know the realization that Jesus was coming to earth. The creator was coming to earth, to its creation. So then... What is the response of the world? When the creator shows up, 
What does the world do? What does creation do to say, whoa, here is the creator? Is that what happens? Let's keep looking and find out. Verse 10, he was in the world and the world was made through him. Once again, the creator has come alongside in human form its creation. John, John, the author, he doesn't tell us exactly how. There's other verses that tell us in other books of the Bible. He kind of just fast forwards. He says, hey, look, Jesus is coming. Whoop, he's in the world now. He's testifying. Now. Jesus is in the world. The one who created the world, the one who created humans, is now a human, still God, but he's human, and he's walking with people. He's giving people hugs. He's obeying his mother. He's working like all other humans. He's eating like all other humans. He's resting like all other humans. God, the creator of the world, is now in human flesh, and these are the things he is doing. He's in the world. That's what it says here. If you ever, you ever wish that God would just show up to you face to face, like, God, just please, if you just showed up, I would believe you, I'd follow you. Guess what? He did. He showed up 2,000 years ago in human form and the man that we call Jesus lived among humans. God, not just good humans, people who hated him, sinful people. He lived among them. When he should have just wiped everybody out and said, that's your fault. I told you not to eat from the tree. You did it. You got the result. Sorry, you can have all the bad stuff that you wanted because that's what you chose. But what does he do? He comes down and he washes their feet. That's the God of this world, y'all. When you open the Bible, when people talk about God, that's the God that the Bible talks about. Any other God, they, they can make it up if they want to, but it's not the God of the Bible. This is the God of the Bible. So then, what do you think the world's response is? Verse 10, he was in the world, the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. They didn't recognize God. You ever seen those, those shows on TV where the celebrities dress up? They dress up and put on fake beards and hats and long hair, and they go to the subway and they start singing, these, these music celebrities. And people are like, man, these people can sing. And then all of a sudden they take all their stuff off and they're like, oh, I didn't know that was you. What's interesting here is God didn't hide himself. God didn't disguise himself. It wasn't like, I don't want you to see me. I'm going to come hang out with you all, but you aren't really going to know it. No, he came. He says he was in the light. He was the light, right? He was the light who came into darkness. There's no way you cannot see that. But they what? They didn't know him. That's what it says. Not because he, he wasn't in a disguise. They just couldn't see him. Why? Because of their darkness. Because of their sin. Because of their hate for God. That when God the creator showed up in our lives, right in front of our face, we said, I still don't see the light. Because that's how depraved and sinful we are. We can say we're good people all we want, but the truth is we're sinful. And it shows right here. Ephesians 4, 17 and 19 says this. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds, the brokenness of their minds, their they are darkened in their understanding, alienated, pushed away from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Due to their hardness of heart, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Paul, the author there, he's telling us the Ephesians. He's saying, look, don't walk in the darkness anymore. That's basically what he's saying. And he describes darkness as this, people who are futile in their minds, darkened in understanding, ignorant, hardness of heart, and they don't realize it because that's who they are. 
And that's who God says that we are if we don't know God. It's very clear. We're either in the darkness or we're in the light. They were in the darkness so much so that they didn't recognize God. And today, we don't have the excuse that Jesus isn't face to face with us, that we can't recognize him. You know why? Because God didn't leave us alone. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us his word. He gave us the church to declare to the world that the light is here. And we are to see the light. So if you, you say, well, I wish Jesus would just show up today. He, he's more than showed up right here, right now. The reason you don't believe is that passage because of the darkness in your life. You are blind to it. And you need God to open your eyes so that you can see the light for who he is. That's what the scripture says. We do not have the excuse to say God's not real. We have more information in our day than we have ever had. We have access to that inf information more than we ever had. You can go home and say, I wonder uh, how big the moon is. You type it in, it'll tell you. You can say, I wonder how long it would take to fly on a plane from here to China. You type it in, it tells you. I wonder how big the Great Wall of China is. You go in, type it. You can watch a 20-minute documentary. You know all the knowledge of it. There is more than enough information today that tells you the fact that Jesus was real. And the Bible is very clear. Either he, he's crazy, he's a liar, or he's God. He's not crazy. He's not a liar. He is God. So we have the fact that God was really here. The reason you and I or whoever doesn't want to respond to him isn't because we don't see the light in a way. It's because we don't want to see the light. We don't want it. Romans 1 tells us very clearly, Psalms tells us, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens tell us everything in creation shouts out, God is real, God is real, God is real. But you and I say, no, he's not, no, he's not, no, he's not, no, he's not, no, he's not. Because of the darkness in our own hearts, because of the sin in which Adam and Eve failed to honor God. That's the reality of Scripture. That's what the scripture says. I'm not making things up. And so I would say to you this morning, if you are in darkness, get away from the darkness and believe upon the light. I said in the introduction, you are either light or you're dark. You're one of the two. You can't switch back and forth. I mean, you can't switch from like dark to light back to dark. But you can switch from darkness to light. If you put your eyes on the light, Jesus Christ. Verse 11, he came to his own, that is his own creation, and his own people, that is his specific people, the Jews, and they didn't receive him. The Jews knew all about the one to come, just like you and I know all about Jesus for the most part. Just like the world knows about Jesus for the most part. The Jews knew, okay, there's a Messiah to come in the future. He's coming. We're waiting for him to come. We're waiting for him to come, waiting for him to come. And when he came, they said, that's not him. I don't want him. Just like you and I, there's God who's existing today, Jesus, who can forgive us of our sin. And we get the message to say, oh, I don't want it. I don't want it. Just like they did. We're not any better than them. He came to his own. Those things that were his because of his creation, he created him. And his own people, that special people that he had at this time, they did not receive him. They missed it. They didn't recognize God when God showed up. Think about that statement. They did not recognize God when God showed up. Why? Because in their darkness, they elevated their own thinking. I know enough of the Old Testament to tell you when God will show up. Jesus is not God who showed up. Kill that man. Why do you think they killed him? So that's not how God... When God comes into this world, when he comes to save us, the, the Jews, he's coming in glory. He's coming on those horses. He's coming on the chariot. He's coming with things laid down and his angels. Everyone's going to know. And he's going to destroy all of y'all. And us Jews, we're going to get to be with him. That Jesus... No, he hangs out with sinners. He hangs out with people who aren't Jews. No, that is not God. See, in their own darkness, 
They darkened their own minds and they couldn't see the fact that God was right in front of their faces. This morning, whatever it is, your excuse is, it's an excuse to not come to the recognition that God is real. He's your creator. He's the one who can offer you life. But we don't want to believe. And all I can simply say is plead with you and say, believe on the light, the one who gives us life. The rest is your responsibility. Can you believe? Verse 12, as we end. But to all who did receive him, there was a group who received him. That means that you can receive him. But all who received him, who believed in his name, how do you receive him? You believe in the name. And what happens when you believe in the name? He gave the right to become children of God. See, at one point, you were children of wrath, according to Ephesians. Because of our sin, God's punishment was coming on you as it came on Adam. But he says, when you believe on Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, to restore your relationship with God, you no longer are children of wrath. God's no longer coming to destroy you. God's coming to take care of you. You are his child. Children of God. How are we children of God? Because we believed in Christ. When we believe in Christ, what does that do? Verse 13. It makes us born. We're born again. Not of blood, not of humans. Not of the will of the flesh, not of just the desire to have a baby, of the will of man, but of who? God. God has made us born again in his own eyes, and we are now considered his children. Children of light, not children of dark. We have the light as our father. Children of God. So do you believe in the light of Jesus Christ? Are you a child of God? Are you a child of the light? Or are you a child of darkness? Let me read this verse to you. Ephesians 5. Therefore do not associate with them, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk, that means to live. Live as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose those things. It is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And I would say the same thing to you. Awake, O dead sleeper. Recognize the light will shine on you and save you. You will be a child of the light. Jesus saves. Let me give you a quick word of encouragement. Because you may not have recognized it, but I skipped part of a verse in this passage. Go to verse 5. The second part of verse 5. The first part says the light shines in the darkness, but I skipped this part. And the darkness has not overcome it. I skipped it on purpose. The darkness has not overcome it. The devil has not, will not, will never overcome the light, Jesus Christ. Those that are in the light, in Jesus Christ, forgiven for their sin, will never be overcome by the penalty of sin. We are set free from the penalty of sin. Darkness in our life will never overcome the light in our life when we're focused on Jesus, the light. It is an encouraging word that the darkness will not ever overcome the light. That is the hope in which we have Jesus Christ. Do you have that hope?